Okay, I think uh, we might start um, so that we can go to lunch um, on time or slightly just a bit late. Um, so good morning, everyone, once again, uh, those in person and also those online. Um, my name is Ryan and I'm a postdoc uh, researcher immunologist at uh, MCRI, um, part of the new vaccines group. And today I'll be chairing the session with um, Dr. Stephanie Clark from a pediatrician from Fiji. So um, welcome to the first research showcase uh, session for the CRE, where uh, the early career researchers will present some of their exciting work um, as part of the CRE program and also the wider pneumococcal research program um, the, the groups at MCRI are involved in. So uh, I think this, is, this session is a good segue uh, from the previous um, session around building the next generation of uh, researchers. Um, and by putting this session uh, at the, the first pro, well, the second or the first program of uh, the, this uh, symposium, it highlights how much the CRE and the uh, research groups here uh, value um, their contributions and how, how much they value uh, early career researchers' work. So you will see later on that the research um, as part of the program covers a huge research breadth and that that covers economic evaluations, epidemiology, microbiology, and immunology. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Alicia Quad. Um, um, Alicia is, uh, is part of the Asia Pacific, is a member of the Asia Pacific Health Research Group at MCRI. She's a pediatrician and currently doing her PhD with the Center of International Child Health uh, at University of Melbourne, exploring um, universal health coverage and global trends in equity in child health outcomes. She has a strong interest in advocacy for health equity and program development for refu refugee populations and children in uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, so Alicia, please. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Ryan mentioned, my name is uh, Alicia Quatch. Um, I am a pediatrician uh, and a PhD student here at University of Melbourne and MCRI. So I really appreciate this opportunity to present some of our work that we're doing in Laos. Um, uh, the Lao out-of-pocket study or, or loop study for, for short. This is a, an observational study that we're looking at the impact of a severe health illness um, on households, looking at financial and, and health impacts. It's a collaborative study between MCRI and our Lao partners over at Lombru in, in Vientiane Capital. Um, and it's great to see our study coordinated here with us today and, and a lot of other international collaborators too. So I might just start with just a bit of uh, background on my PhD. As, as Ryan mentioned, my PhD is really broadly based on child health uh, equity and universal health coverage for children globally. Um, we know that universal health coverage is a vital component of the sustainable development goals, uh, but it's also the, the underpinning the concept of health equity as well. And universal health coverage is composed of three main um, components. One being the coverage and access to essential healthcare services, two, healthcare services that are of good quality, um, and three, healthcare services that don't place households into financial hardship. And that's the third section that this study is, is mainly focusing on. The SDGs proposed uh, that by 2030, 80% of the world's population should be accessing essential healthcare services, and that nobody should be placed in financial uh, hardship due to out-of-pocket costs. And that's because we know out-of-pocket costs are inequitable and inefficient way to finance uh, health services. And yet so many countries are still relying on, on this way of financing, often, often the poorer nations. So we're not on target to what the SDGs are hoping for. Um, now, what do I mean by financial hardship? So there's lots of different ways to measure this and the health economists in the room will, <laughs> will tell you that there's many, many ways, but it generally falls under two main categories. Uh, one being catastrophic health expenditures, and the second one being impoverishment. So catastrophic health expenditures, a bit of a mouthful, but it basically means when your out-of-pocket costs uh, exceed the threshold of your household, a certain threshold of your household's income or your household's income um, capacity to pay. Um, 
And in this figure here that was released in the most recent WHO and World Bank financial report, they used the threshold of 10% of household income annually. And this placed almost 1 billion people into the category of catastrophic health expenditures. Um, the second category that I mentioned was impoverishment. And this one means where your out-of-pocket costs pushes the household into poverty or for those already sitting in poverty, pushing them further down that poverty line. And with this um, category using the international poverty, current poverty line of US dollars $1.90 uh, per day, placed 70 million people into poverty and 435 that are already sitting in poverty further down that poverty line. So in total, you can see here at least 1.4 billion people in the world are experiencing financial hardship due to uh, out-of-pocket costs. And this, this data is pre-COVID, so we know this, this figures are actually even worse now, which makes this a, a global health crisis. So when we're evaluating financial protection as a part of universal health coverage, we, we must remember that component of, of equity. So universal health coverage means that um, everyone receives essential health care that they need doesn't necessarily mean the same health care applies to everybody. It also means that the health care services and systems and infrastructure that individuals need to access the health care will differ across the nation as well. So when we're assessing universal health coverage, we must look at disaggregated data so that we can see the differences amongst the subpopulation groups and identify the most vulnerable populations that are missing out. And the differences are going to depend on the intervention as well. So um, looking at that graph on the left, a bit of a busy graph, but essentially it's looking at the catastrophic health expenditures uh, depending on wealth quintiles in the European region. Um, and as expected, it, the dark blue there is, is looking at the poorest quintile, which is taking up the bulk of catastrophic health expenditures. On the right-hand side, uh, it's disaggregated by geography in Southeast Asia, um, looking at out-of-pocket costs between rural and urban regions. And in this graph here, you can see that depending on the country, it actually differs. So some countries actually spend more in the rural regions um, for out-of-pocket costs and others in urban. I will say the caveat here is that this is not uh, taking into account that a lot of households are probably actually not even accessing healthcare um, as well. So as this is the CRE for pneumonia, what's, what's the relevance of financial protection and, and pneumonia, you might say? So we know that pneumonia is still on the leading causes of hospital admissions for children worldwide, and hospital admissions and the out-of-pocket costs related to it create high financial burdens for a lot of uh, households. Not just the direct costs of care, like uh, medicines and, and tests, but also the non-medical costs, such as transportation, accommodation for the patient and caregiver, and the loss of productivity or income that the caregiver has to sustain by staying with the, their child in hospital. So a recent systematic review um, looking at the cost of management of childhood pneumonia in Asia and Africa showed that the out-of-pocket cost um, for hospital management ranged somewhere between 27% to 116% of their monthly household income. So they're spending more than they're actually making. When uh, the WHO revised the pneumonia um, definition back in 2014, it was with the hope that it will decrease the amount of unnecessary hospitalizations with treatment in hospital being reserved for those with severe pneumonia. Um, and those were the children that had respiratory illness plus an emergency sign. And that's different from the previous um, uh, definition, which had severe pneumonia with just respiratory symptoms with chest in drawing. So a recent observational study in Laos where our study is um, taking place showed that hospitals are still adhering to the previous definition, um, whereby severe pneumonia, as I mentioned, is categorised by cough, tachypnea and chest in drawing, not necessarily uh, with danger signs every time. So in this instance, all three prongs of universal health coverage are being affected. So by adhering to the previous definition, there remains a large proportion of unnecessary hospital admissions and out-of-pocket costs to these households are potentially leading them into financial hardship. Um, access to appropriate outpatient care is either not being uh, followed or potentially not available, 
which is then hindering inpatient access to other conditions if beds are being taken up by non-severe pneumonia. And then the third uh, point is that if we're not using current evidence-based practice, means that quality of care is not an expected standard. So these are all important considerations when we're assessing the impact of pneumonia, not just at the individual household level, but also at national and global level when we're making public health recommendations. So our study um, is hoping to examine some of these aspects. We hope to determine the financial and health impact of a severe childhood illness, including pneumonia uh, on a household. Which takes me to our study, the, the LUTE study. So in Laos, universal health coverage has come to the forefront in their most recent national socioeconomic development plan uh, with the promise of universal quality healthcare service for everyone that needs it without financial hardship. So our study aims to see how well this is being implemented by measuring the out-of-pocket expenses for households related to a severe acute illness or injury for children under 15 years presenting to hospitals in Laos. Uh, we aim to measure the financial protection by measuring uh, the, uh, the prevalence of catastrophic health expenditures and impoverishment from these out-of-pocket expenses. We'll also be looking at the physical health outcomes and quality of life outcomes for children and their household members following the presentation to hospital. And then also perform an equity analysis to look at the differences um, of outcomes across wealth quintiles, geography, sex, parental education, and ethnic subpopulations. So our target primary outcome will be looking at total out-of-pocket expenses related to the acute illness, so we'll be looking at both the direct medical and non-medical costs uh, related to the illness, but also the indirect costs, um, as I mentioned, the productivity loss um, related to the illness. Secondary outcomes will include catastrophic health expenditures. And we're gonna be looking at a range of thresholds uh, for this definition. The 10% annual household income, as I mentioned, that's uh, being monitored by WHO and World Bank is our primary one but we'll also be looking at the 10% monthly um, household threshold to look at more of the immediate impact, um, but also looking at a proportion of capacity of pay, which it, by definition is the household income minus subsistence spending, which is such as food um, and uh, clothing, which uh, essentially allows us to target more or identify the poorer households more. Uh, we'll also be looking at impoverished health expenditure and be using the international poverty line as well as Laos uh, national poverty line. We'll be looking at coping strategies, which are the strategies families use to financial, uh, finance out-of-pocket costs, uh, which might be they're using their savings or borrowing from others or um, reducing their con household consumption. Uh, we'll be looking at inpatient management to uh, see if they're adhering to quality standards. Um, and then also looking at health outcomes for the child and household members, um, mainly that of mortality, uh, whether they come back to hospital, nutritional status and quality of life as scored through validated um, quality of life questionnaires. So this is a prospective longitudinal study of children uh, up to 15 years, uh, attending hospital for treatment and then follow up uh, over two months in Laos. We've defined severe illness as a child presenting to hospital with acute illness or injury, plus emergency signs as defined by the WHO pocketbook, or if the child requires hospital admission for investigations and treatments that can't be performed in an outpatient or emergency department setting. Um, we'll be recruiting from two hospitals to show a varying a range of health settings. So one being the National Children's Hospital, which is a tertiary hospital in Vientiane capital. It's, our, it's their main referral hospital for central Laos um, and is in an urban setting. Our second hospital is in Salavan um, province down in South Lao, which covers a, a larger urban and rural area um, uh, and has a different demographic down there. The study will be performed over four visits, two of them being in hospital, at hospital admission and at discharge. Third visit as a phone visit at two weeks post discharge, and then the fourth visit at two months back in the outpatient department, um, two months after discharge. Data is going to be collected mainly through household questionnaires uh, with the parent and caregiver to collect data on out of pocket costs um, and demographic questions, and also the quality of life questionnaires. Um, we'll also be um, measuring their heights and weights for nutritional status, and then uh, 
and looking at medical records for inpatient management. Um, now, as we've literally only started recruitment in the last week and have a whole <laughs> N equals two, I don't have any data to present to you today. So I hope I'll come back to show you some of that. But I thought I'd take a bit of a different spin and, and talk about setting up a study overseas. Um, and it actually goes in really well with what uh, Dr. Um, Saha and Dr. Uh, um, Itob were talking about this morning. Um, as a PhD student, I think you learn early in the piece what you set out to do in the beginning, never ends up being what you end up doing down the track. And that's actually a, a good thing to be a bit flexible. Um, and a large portion of, of your time is probably setting up and, and collaborating um, and setting up the study. And, and this definitely has been the case with the LOOT study. So going back, our initial plan was actually looking at under five-year-olds, with severe illness, possibly focusing on pneumonia across multiple sites across Laos. Um, but our early collaborations with our, with our team at Lomru found that this was not gonna be feasible or, or appropriate. Um, feedback was that the Ministry of Health was more interested in a range of severe conditions and not just pneumonia. They were in the midst of the pandemic. So lockdowns across the country, children weren't accessing care, no one was attending hospital, um, it was mainly for COVID. Um, and so the rural district hospitals didn't have the, the patients or the staff to participate in the study. And the, the bigger uh, limiting factor is, is budget as always, wasn't gonna allow multiple sites as we had hoped. So in collaboration with our um, colleagues over in Lao, we paired it back to two study sites that still had moderate levels of pediatric presentations and then extended our inclusion criteria to include children up to 15 years which would mean a higher chance of meeting our sample size, and, but also include a wider range of conditions. So our study design evolved with time and on, along with ongoing discussions with teams from other departments and stakeholders. And I've listed like, you know, a few of the uh, departments that we've had to um, collaborate along the way. I'm sure there's some I've missed and I'm sure there'll be more that I'll add onto this. But as you can be aware, setting up a study uh, requires a bit of red tape as well. So multiple ethics applications in our case, three to Australia, UK and Laos, working through finance and budgets and, and legal collaborations, um, all takes a little bit more time than anticipated, but all great learning experiences. Um, but I think the most rewarding and enjoyable part of setting up a study is overseas is the collaborative nature of it. The important take home message for me, and I think it echoes what we've heard this morning is that setting up studies, um, are, 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 overseas are set up and completed in partnership, but they should be led by local researchers. Local researchers, they have the best understanding of evidence gaps and they can present the research to collaborators such as hospital staff or whoever else might be involved and policy makers as well. And they have a better understanding of the political and cultural context in their country. But gaining community engagement, such an important component of any study, but even more so when the community is not our own. So having a local research team um, means that you know, they've got established trust in the community and makes any research activity gain more traction and willingness from the participants. But it also ensures cultural respect and appropriateness as well. So I find these really golden opportunities to learn from each other. Um, and the reason I love working in this space in global health, um, COVID has meant that I haven't been able to travel to Laos in the last few years, but I hope to uh, do that in the coming year and, and strengthen these, these learnings and these relationships. So I really look forward to these ongoing collaborations and the, and the future opportunities it may create for our local research capacity. Um, so I thought I'd just end with some photos from my last trip in Laos back in 2019. I was fortunate enough to go with my family, but also establish some really great um, long lasting relationships with our study team there, one who's in our audience today. Um, and I thank you for your time and acknowledge the teams and our funders as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Alicia. Um, I forgot to mention that we'll leave the questions to the end. Um, so we'll proceed to the next speaker. Next, we have a, a tech team of uh, Dr. John Hart and Dr. Laura Boyson. So both John and uh, Laura has recently got their PhD in the last year or earlier this year. So uh, who's, uh, Laura is first. So Laura, um, her research focuses on microbial genomics and uh, the microbiome uh, with a focus on global child health and vaccination. And her key interest lies in exploring the impact of uh, PCV vaccination on bacterial carriage. 
And uh, for John is a medical epidemiologist, and he has a strong interest in clinical trials, tropical medicine, and um, child health. Um, so today they will be uh, talking to us about whole genome sequencing on uh, to assess the vaccine effectiveness against antimicrobial resistance in Laos and Mongolia. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, and I apologize for the mouthful you just had to go through. Um, I won't repeat that, but I'll be um, focusing more on the use, using genomics to predict antimicrobial resistance in these two countries. So, yeah. um, so obviously, as you know, antimicrobial resistance is a global problem, and Streptococcus pneumoniae is among the top six pathogens causing death attributable to antimicrobial resistance. Um, the genetic determinants for antimicrobial resistance in pneumococci are actually quite well characterized. So we know a lot about the genes and mutations which cause antimicrobial resistance. Um, so based on this, uh, there's a pneumococcal specific bioinformatic pipeline that has been developed by the CDC, which can predict antimicrobial resistance from whole genome sequencing data and this pipeline has been quite well validated in high income countries, but there's less data from the Asia Pacific, particularly because there's not a lot of pneumococcal genomes from these regions. So the aim of this work is to examine whether we can use genomics to accurately predict um, antimicrobial resistance in pneumococci from two countries in the Asia Pacific. Um, so there were two studies that were um, examining pneumococcal carriage in children uh, with pneumonia in both Laos and Mongolia. Um, and the nas nasopharyngeal swabs were collected in both studies. And we cultured and isolated pneumococci from a total of 576 uh, samples. <coughs> Sorry. And that includes 349 from Laos and 227 from Mongolia. So we tested phenotypically using e-tests and disk diffusion tests. And we used the CS CLSI breakpoints for determining uh, susceptibility and non-susceptibility, which we, the non-susceptibility was defined as intermediate or resistant. And for genotypic testing, we did whole genome sequencing on those 576 isolates after they had DNA extracted. And we analyzed the results using the CDC AMR pipeline. So we wanted to look at the overall agreement between the two methods, looking at the categorization of susceptibility and non-susceptibility. And so you can see for both sites, <coughs> there is some differences. Uh, so there was a very high concordance, I would say for um, non-beta-lactam antimicrobials and the dotted line, shoot, I can't see because I'm not highlighting it, um, indicates uh, a 90% agreement between the two methods. Um, and so most of these non-beta-lactams were well, up at around that or above that. Um, however, the results were a little bit more variable for the, for the beta-lactams, as you can see. I also say that rifampicin down the bottom was included in the Lao data, but not the Mongolia data, because there weren't any results for, no, there weren't any non-susceptibility, non-susceptible isolates for Mongolia. Um, so you can see for the beta-lactams, there is quite a bit of variability. Um, so thinking about why that is the case, when, when you look at how beta-lactam resistance is predicted, the pipeline uses three amino acid, um, three penicillin binding proteins and looks at the amino acid sequence variations from the wild type. So in this um, graph I have, each bar represents a PBP type and at the bottom, goes up increasing to more um, resistant more resistant PBP types and you can see the black lines indicate amino acid variations so the more amino acid variations the more resistant and that we found in our data set that there were a new PBP type that hadn't been characterized for at least one protein in a just under half the isolates from both Laos and Mongolia, which would explain some of the reason there's not excellent concordance between the two. But even when we looked at some of the ones that had, non, had known PBP types, it wasn't completely predictive of resistance. So this 
uh, graph has um, the PBP, the known PBP types down the bottom, and the um, along the y-axis it has the penicillin uh, phenotypic minimum inhibitory concentrations. And I've coloured the results by the phenotypic results and the genotypic are in the shape. So ideally, above that dotted uh, green line, which is the breakpoint for uh, resistance or sensitivity, there should be just triangles and below that line, there should just be circles. And you can see for some of them, there's still those triangles below the line in indicating that they were predicted to be resistant, but they were actually uh, sensitive. So the next step for this work is to, um, oh, sorry, in summary, um, genomics was highly accurate predicting non beta lactam antimicrobial resistance um, in both Laos and Mongolia, but it was less accurate for beta lactam antimicrobial resistance. And I think this really highlights the need to validate genomic approaches in regions where there isn't a lot of information. Um, and so my next steps are to try other tools and approaches. And if that, if they, the known tools and approaches are not um, successful, then we may need to have a custom or country specific uh, database for looking at that. And I'll now pass on to Oh, also, thank you to all the people in the study. I don't have time to go into it, but thank you. Um, and I'll pass on to John to talk about how that data applies. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Laura, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk now about our study um, looking at the effectiveness of uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine against AMR in pneumococci in Laos. So firstly, um, some, uh, a couple more introductory slides. So we all know antimicrobial resistance is, is an increasing um, global problem. Um, and, and this modeling here shows that um, um, approximately 5 million deaths annually are, are associated with uh, antimicrobial resistance and more and one million deaths annually directly attributable to, to AMR. So the, the, the chart here shows those deaths associated with in light purple and directly attributable in the dark purple for AMR to, um, for various um, antibiotics and you can, for various um, bacteria. And you can see those uh, leading bacteria uh, in which AMR is causing deaths are E. coli, Staph aureus, Klebsiella and Pneumococcus. So there are relatively limited data on antimicrobial resistance in pneumococci from, from low income settings. So uh, a systematic review for WHO um, conducted by Fiona Russell's group uh, just published this year found just um, seven studies from low income countries with um, pneumonia clinical outcomes with uh, penicillin resistant pneumococci. And with that limited number of studies, they reported very weak evidence for no difference in, in clinical outcomes. So where we're planning to do this um, study in Laos, we have ongoing um, surveillance and uh, Mimi is, is here from Laos and is gonna talk about the um, characteristics of the, the ARI that we're um, as part of that uh, surveillance in Laos. So pneumococcal conjugate vaccine for reducing antimicrobial um, resistance. So we know that PCV prevents pneumonia and invasive pneumococcal disease by targeting vaccine serotype. So how is it reducing AMR? So there's two mechanisms. We know that um, the um, vaccine serotypes are the ones that are most likely to carry um, antimicrobial resistance. So by directly targeting those, we're directly reducing antimicrobial resistance. Um, and secondly, <clears throat> by reducing pneumonia and um, invasive pneumococcal disease, we're reducing the requirement for antibiotics and that driver of, um, of antimicrobial resistance. So there's, there's data from the US that shows that PCV13 has reduced childhood uh, invasive pneumococcal disease AMR by up to 75%. Um, and there's a, a, another study here shown in this chart, which shows after introduction of PCV increase in susceptible pneumococci um, to various um, antibiotics. You can see the, the white is after 
introduction of PCV and the black is before um, introduction. Um, so despite this, um, relatively few countries in Asia have um, uh, introduced a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. So if, if there were more data available, if we can show that, um, that PCV is of some value in reducing AMR, then this may be uh, important to countries when they're looking at this relatively uh, expensive vaccine in PCV, if that additional effect can be added into those cost effectiveness analyses for policymakers, then that may be may push their decisions towards introducing this vaccine. So our study in Laos, uh, our ongoing surveillance is looking at children admitted with ARI to Mahasot Hospital in, in the capital of Laos, VNTM. They have nasal pharyngeal swabs taken on admission and the, there's genotypic um, AMR testing done on those samples here, which Laura has given a, um, a good um, background of. Our sample size is, is 2,000. This study is ongoing uh, and will be ongoing into next year. The primary outcome will be the presence of pneumococcal AMR to penicillin, keftriaxone, erythromycin or vancomycin, so antibiotics widely used in Laos, uh, interpreted using non-meningitis breakpoints. And the secondary outcomes will be pneumococcal AMR at meningitis breakpoints, uh, multi-drug resistance and AMR to each of the, the 16 antibiotics that are being tested. So the data we've got available to date are up to the end of December last year, and collection is planned uh, up to April next year when we uh, think we'll reach the, the sample size. So this is really a work in progress, and the main analyses haven't been conducted at this stage. Um, so up to the end of uh, December last year, uh, just over 1,500 samples have been collected and just under a third of those, uh, from just under a third of those pneumococci were isolated. Um, this table shows the um, characteristics of uh, participants in the study by those who were, were fully vaccinated for PCV13 and those who were under vaccinated um, so some things that stand out, the, the main ethnicity in Laos, those were Lao Loom, they were more likely to be fully vaccinated than the ethnic minorities. Um, those with a, a higher maternal education <clears throat> were also more likely to be fully vaccinated. Um, and in those who were, uh, in those from whom pneumococci were isolated and those from whom pneumococci weren't isolated, similar levels of um, vaccination. So the data on <clears throat> susceptibility, um, we can see quite high antibiotic resistance as we, do, we would expect um, and, and much higher meningitis breakpoints for those um, antibiotics, penicillin, kefotaxime and, and keftriaxone. Very high resistance to, to other antibiotics such as meropenem and, and, and kefiroxime. Um, and, and others, um, but uh, all isolates susceptible to, to, to some antibiotics. So um, in conclusion, the our provisional analyses show that um, AMR is high in this setting as we expected, uh, more than 50% um, antimicrobial resistance to meropenem, kefiroxime, erythromycin, codromoxazole and, and tetracycline. Um, and we anticipate that this study uh, will determine whether PCV13 has reduced AMR in pneumococcal colonization in Laos. Um, and we, we think that will be useful for, for the country and for the region, as we've said, um, for, for countries that are considering introduction of PCV, that additional knowledge on the impact of, of this vaccine on, on AMR will be of interest. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much. And, um, a thank you, of course, to, to our team here at MCRI and the team at uh, Lomru who have been uh, working hard collecting these data and are continuing to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John and Dr. Bolson, on your presentation of your study. Um, good morning, Mbula, everyone. I would like to 
present and welcome our next speaker, Dr. Ladafone Bonville. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Dr. Ladafone graduated with a bachelor's degree as a medical doctor in Lao and will be studying a master's in public health at the University of Auckland next year. She has been working at Lao Oxford Mahasaud well Hospital Welcome Trust Research Unit as a research assistant and currently working with Fiona and Alicia on pneumococcal projects in Lao. Welcome, Dr. Ladafon. Um, good morning, everyone. So thanks for uh, introducing and thanks for having me here. So I'm, uh, I'm really honored and very excited to be here to share about the study in Laos. So um, once another study in Laos entitled Pneumonia Surveillance um, over eight years from 2013 until 2021. So um, first of all, I will go through the reasons why we conduct this study in Laos. And uh, secondly, I will share the hospital-based study that we did and uh, I will conclude the key findings. Um, Lao made some progress in reducing undefined mortality and stay on track to um, achieve its national target. Regarding the MDG in 2015, the undefined mortality rate was at 70 per thousand of live births. Um, however, this, um, this figure has not met um, international target yet. And this, this were the, the highest rate in Southeast Asia with uh, pneumonia is the leading cause. Um, in addition to this, Laos is a developing country with uh, weaknesses in health infrastructure and limited resource setting. So there are um, limited data on epidemiology and etiology of pneumonia in Laos. And um, currently Laos is trying to stay on track to, to achieve the SDG by 2030, to, um, aiming to reduce under five mortality rate to less than 25 per thousand of live births. So I, I think um, this work would be challenging for Lao government, especially health uh, sector to, to deal with. And um, I think a much understanding of characterization of um, epidemiology and etiology would, would assist Lao to, to improve the case management and uh, the, the treatment uh, efficacy. So um, further study and more intervention are required to, to, to help this. So, and what we did, we, we conducted a hospital-based pneumonia surveillance um, from 2013 until 2021. What, what are the purpose of our study? We, we would like to focus on describing the data set of um, eight years. So um, we, we want to describe the pneumonia um, epidemiology at a tertiary healthcare center in Vientiane capital by, um, by characteristics, by treatment um, outcomes, including viral and bacterial detection results. Another important aim is we, we would like to determine if um, PCV13 and the immunization of um, children admitted to hospital was associated with severe, severe pneumonia. So um, this study was a hos hospital-based study in collaboration with Lao Oxford Mohosut Hospital, um, Welcome Track Research Unit Alumru. Um, our study site was Mahosot Hospital, which is the largest healthcare center in Yangchan. Um, it is a 365 bed hospital providing um, primary, secondary, and tertiary healthcare with um, roughly 2,000 admissions per month. Apart from that, Mahosot Hospital also has um, microbiology 
laboratory facilities as well. Uh, regarding the inclusion criteria, we recruit children aged between two months to 59 months admitted to hospital with a history of illness less than 14 days and um, history of fever and plus one or more of dyspnea, cough, runny nose, or lung abnormal auscultation. Um, all children admitted from general pediatric, uh, pediatric infectious disease and pedi pediatric ICU were screened for eligib eligibility criteria by our study team in Laos. Uh, for those who were eligible, the written informed consent was obtained from the parent and, or the guardian. Um, demographic data and medical history were, collect were collected using a, a questionnaire that we um, interview the parent or the guardian, or uh, we, we uh, will check the medical, available medical records as well. Uh, with the PCV vaccination status, this was confirmed by um, review of um, health center records and um, maternal and child health book with um, assist us to to, um, to determine how many doses of PCV obtained and, and the deaths given. Um, for children aged between two months to 11 months, receiving two doses and aged more than 12 months receiving one dose, they were determined as PCV vaccinated. vaccinated. Um, in contrast, for, for children aged between two months to 11 months, receiving zero to one dose and aged more than 12 months, obtaining zero dose, they were determined as PCV-13 under vaccinated. Um, we, we collect nasal swab, uh, nasal pharyngeal swab and throat swab. So um, for nasal and throat swab specimen, they, they were transported uh, to Lomru laboratory to, to detect the um, multiple viruses and um, bacteria by uh, using QRT-PCR. For the nasal pharyngeal specimens, uh, they were shipped to MCRI to, to detect the pneumococcal carriage using um, LIT-AQ-PCR. Um, between December 2013 until December 2021, there were 1,672 patients enrolled in the study. Um, the median age was 14 months and 40% um, were infants aged less than 12 months. Uh, over half of the participants were males compared to females at 55.3 uh, versus 44.7. The, the majority of um, NXT were Laolum. So um, the percentage of Laolum participants receiving uh, PCV vaccinated was higher uh, being under vaccinated at uh, 94 compared to 80.5. Um, by contrast, uh, in terms of the pa uh, participants who were who were monk, di different ethnicity, uh, we, we can see that the, the proportion of under of being under vaccinated was higher than being vaccinated at 16.4 uh, versus 4.8 percent. Uh, moving to mother's educational level, uh, different education level of mother uh, were likely to, to have an impact on um, checking healthcare services and health outcomes. We, we can see that um, uh, from, from this table that 69.4% uh, were mother with, uh, with below university level. Of this, we, we can see that the percentage of um, 
children being under vaccinated was higher than being vaccinated at 83.1 versus 69.7%. Um, of 1,672 patients enrolled, 33.3 had severe pneumonia, 29.3 had non-severe pneumonia, and 36.2 were non-pneumonia ARI. So it can be seen that um, a higher percentage in severe pneumonia at 42% uh, than non-severe pneumonia and non-pneumonia ARI were, immun were under-immunized. And um, the, the most frequent antibiotic group given were penicillin G, beta-lactam, cephalosporin. And when we're looking at the comorbidities, we can see that malnutrition was more likely to, to have uh, severe pneumonia than non-severe pneumonia and non-pneumonia ARI at 9.1%. And um, non-severe pneumonia and non-pneumonia ARI were more likely to, to recover whereas um, severe pneumonia contribute to the death at 2.5%. Um, from, from this table, we can see that the odds of severe pneumonia were 22% lower in the PCV fully vaccinated group. So the, the, um, the odd ratio that we used uh, to adjust for was aged gender, ethnicity, exposure to smoking and season, but we, we exclude malnutrition because um, this variable has a lot of missing data. Uh, we tested multiple viruses and bacteria. And um, in this table, we, we only include the most common microorganism detected over eight years. And uh, we, we show the data and, uh, per year. So to begin with viruses, we, we, we can see that HRSV AB was the most common virus detected in each year over the study period. And um, Haemophilus influenza was frequently detected uh, in each year as well. Um, this light graph uh, illustrates the um, microorganism detected per month over eight years. And um, we, we can see that there, there were a peak in um, microorganism detection during the wet season from start from July until October, um, especially uh, HRSV and hemophilus influenza. Uh, moving to pneumococcal carriage, so um, the data we, we have now are provisional data because we have data up until 2019 and um, our COVID pandemic has slowed down the shipment, but uh, we are planning to ship the, the rest of the specimen to finalize the data soon. So in the table, we also separate the data and present the data per year. Uh, in terms of the, the light graph, this uh, illustrates the number of pneumococcal detected um, per month from, from 2013 until, 20, uh, until 2019. But uh, we didn't see um, evidence about the seasonal variation about the pneumococcal carriage. So um, to sum up, we, we found that um, children, those who were under vaccinated with the comorbidity, especially malnutrition, were, were more likely to have severe pneumonia. And we found that um, HISV, um, S pneumonia, hemophilus influenza were the most common uh, microorganism detected. And I think, um, when the RSV vaccine become available, it would be an important vaccine for, for our government to consider. 
and we also found that there was a peak in the um, um, HISV detection and um, hemophilus influenza detection during the vestition, whereas we we don't we um, did not have evidence about the seasonal variation about the pneumococcal carriage. So we found that um, those who were PCV 13 fully vaccinated had uh, had roughly 22% lower of uh, CV anemia than those who were under vaccinated. Um, however, I, I think our understanding of um, epidemiology of um, respiratory, respiratory infection um, in Lao, more body uh, are still relative limit, limited because we, we conducted and um, recruited the, the patient and the samples from, the, from a single hospital. So I, I hope that in, in the future, we, we can extend to additional sites to, to see the epidemiology more broadly. Um, and finally, I would like to, to say thank you to our colleagues here uh, from MCRI, including from Lomru, uh, and um, especially many thanks to all participants and their families to, to in, involve in, in this study. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ladafon, on your presentation. Our next guest speaker will join us through Zoom. She is Mrs. Uh, Isito Jagni. No. Mrs. Isito is a master in, uh, of science in epidemiology graduate from the London School of um, Health and Tropical Medicine and has worked at the clinical trial research unit at the Medical Research Council in Gambia, examining effect of intrapartum azithromycin on neonatal sepsis and mortality. She's passionate about maternal, neonatal, and child health and has a keen interest in antimicrobial resistance. She's currently enrolled as a graduate researcher at Uni Melbourne within the Asia Pacific Group at MCRI. Welcome, um, Mrs. Isito. So thank you for that introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Aisa Dujan. Um, today I would be presenting work um, as part of my research um, um, within the Asia Pacific group. So we've heard from um, previous speakers um, about um, child mortality rates um, in the world and the burden of pneumonia um, in, in parts of the world, um, especially in low middle income countries. Um, some research have actually shown that um, higher pneumococcal colonization density in the upper respiratory tract um, enhances transmission of pneumococci. It increases the likelihood of developing pneumonia as well as increases the disease severity um, in children. Um, PCVs, as we've heard as well, have been effective in reducing pneumococcal disease as well as vaccine type pneumococcal carriage. However, the effect on um, colonization density, which has been associated with pneumonia, um, is still unclear. The evidence so far um, has been inconsistent. Some other factors, um, apart from vaccination with PCV, are known or have been shown in studies to affect pneumococcal density. And so, um, Factors such as symptomatic respiratory tract infections, viral co-infection um, have been associated with high density, um, high pneumococcal colonization density, whereas um, age and, and prior antibiotic use, among others, are associated with lower um, density. So I would be presenting um, a systematic review that I've conducted and completed. Um, and it has been submitted for um, publication and is currently on the review. So the research question that I looked at was, does PCVs 7, 10, and 13, or do these PCVs alter um, pneumococcal colonization density in children under five years of age? Um, the population was um, 
children from either hospital um, who are either hospitalized or um, from the community. Um, the intervention was these three PCVs that I've mentioned. Um, they were compared to no vaccine, so vaccinated children um, compared to unvaccinated children. The outcome of interest um, was pneumococcal nisopharyngeal colonization density. And the time frame that we looked at was from um, 2000 to 2021, I'd have to say um, mid-December of 2021. And the aim was to describe the effect of PCVs 7, 10, and 13 on density among children under five years of age. And the protocol was registered on Prospera. Um, in this flow chart, um, um, I show um, the studies that um, we looked at. Um, so studies were identified from PubMed, Embase, and Medline. Um, about 2,300 studies were imported for screening, um, of which 353 were duplicates, which were removed. Um, 1,941 studies were screened um, um, by myself and another reviewer, Ashley. Um, and we identified 20 full text studies that were assessed for eligibility um, or against that eligibility criteria. And so 10 studies um, were included in this systematic review. The inclusion criteria were that the studies had to be an original research article in English published um, within the time frame of 20, I mean, 2000 to 2021. Um, with any study design, um, looking at the three PCVs mentioned earlier, and which um, reported density in vaccinated children compared to unvaccinated children. And um, we excluded um, unpublished or gray literature, non-human studies, um, reviews, case reports, um, uh, protocols, etc. So in terms of quality assessment, um, I looked at the risk of bias um, using tools developed by the National Heart, Brain and Lung Institute. Um, for each of the different study designs, there was a tool attached to it. And, and the tools were looking at different um, aspects of our methodology and how these were um, reported in each of the studies. For example, for RCTs, where they identified as an RTC, what was randomization like um, for observational studies where conf was confounding looked into and how was that um, identified or whether or not there were justifications made for um, uh, sample size, say, in terms of um, a case control study. And these studies were then qualitatively assessed and rated as poor, fair, or um, good quality. In terms of microbiology assessment, I looked at the appropriateness of um, sample collection, um, the, uh, the swap type, um, the transport uh, storage, as well as um, the lab techniques used in determining density, and checked these against WHO guidelines. So moving on to the results, um, for the risk of bias assessment, um, nine studies were rated as fair and um, one RCT was rated as of good quality. And the reasons um, for these study class classification as fair was just insufficient detail in the study methods um, on the papers or articles that were identified. And in terms of microbiological um, assessment overall, um, the studies, um, followed WHO recommendation and the um, laboratory methods used for determining density were all acceptable. Um, this table shows um, the characteristics of the studies that were included in the review. Um, I've um, shown them, uh, categorizing them into two um, studies that were done um, using semi-quantitative culture methods to determine density, as well as um, studies that were done using um, the more sensitive PCR, um, lit A PCR methods. Um, and on your left side, you would see um, the different countries in which um, these studies were performed in, and the years um, um, essentially uh, that they were, th these studies were published. 
And most of the um, studies were cross-sectional surveys, as we can see from the um, on, on the from the table. There was only one case control study and one retrospective cohort, and there were um, four um, RCTs. Although one of them was considered a cross-sectional survey because um, only part of the participant data was analyzed in that study, and um, also, the vaccines that were evaluated are shown, as well as the number of participants. Just a side note, for the Gambia study in 2012, instead of the number of participants shown, it's the total number of samples that were tested um, that is shown. In terms of density results, um, here I, I show that what we found was um, three sets of results. So there were studies that I actually found that there is higher density, um, pneumococcal colonization density among vaccinated children in comparison to unvaccinated children. Whereas some other studies have shown that there were lower density, in fact, among vaccinated compared to unvaccinated. And there were um, four other studies that show that um, they, there was no detectable differences between these two groups. Um, in conclusion, um, we found still conflicting evidence regarding the impact of PCV on nesopharyngeal lymphocal density, um, likely due to a heterogeneity of studies. Um, again, factors um, other than PCV could be at play here, as I've alluded to earlier, that there are other factors that affect density, some of which were not looked at in these studies. Um, so in terms of the limitations, um, for the studies that we looked at, only healthy children were um, included in all of those studies that were included in the review, and these results may not be generalizable to unwell or hospitalized children. Um, none of the studies um, included in the review had um, reported on viral testing, although some may have done it um, later on, and only half of the studies has also, had also assessed antibiotic use, which we know um, or um, research have shown that reduces um, density. So the use of standardized methodology is necessary to better understand the association between PCVs and density. Um, the recommendation for further studies is evaluate, I mean, in, evaluating vaccine impact and density is to use quantitative molecular methods um, to measure density, as well as collect data um, that is known to um, affect um, density, including viral co-colonization, antibiotic use, and multiple serotype carriage. So um, future work that I would be doing um, um, it includes um, one of which is this. Um, I'll be looking at this question. What is the PCV13 dosage effect on um, colonization density among children under five um, with CV pneumonia in Laos, Mon Mongolia, and Papua New Guinea? Um, in these studies, I'd be using data from these three studies. Um, I mean, from these three sites, um, from studies that have been conducted um in collaboration with MCRI. Um, so the study population we looked at is children under five who are presenting at a hospital or health center with ARI in these three sites. Um, the effect of PCV13 will be determined individually because of the different eligibility criteria for the and the different studies um, within these sites. Um, the hypothesis is that um, vaccination, PCV vaccination in particular, will reduce um, pneumococcal carrier density, and that the effect will be highest in children who received more doses of vaccine, i.e. three versus zero or two or one versus um, zero. So I intend to do a multiple linear regression um, to answer the question that I've identified. The exposure of interest will be PCV vaccination studies um, classified as follows, either three versus zero, two or one versus zero. Um, and the outcome of interest will be pneumococcal density measured using quantitative PCR methods. 
So con confounding will be identified um, using a DAG um, that's shown on the left. Um, in this DAG, um, very briefly, you'd see um, three causal pathways from um, PCV vaccination to um, density, um, some of which have um, are not direct um, and go through mostly um, PCV, um, I mean, and pneumococcal carriage. Uh, so I would like to thank my supervisors, um, Fiona, Claire, and Catherine um, for the support and guidance, as well as the supervision I've received. I'd also like to um, thank Monica and Ashley, um, Susanna, Paul, who I haven't um, put on the slide, as well as the study staff in Laos, PNG, and Mongolia and the study participants and their families. Thank you very much. That's all from me. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce and welcome Mr. Fan Fan. Mr. Fan has a master's degree and is a research associate uh, working in the res um, respiratory bacteria lab based at Pasteur Institute of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. His research focuses on antimicrobial resistance and genomic uh, phylogenetic diversities, as well as pneumococcal vaccine immuno immunology. He was working with Paul on the Vietnam pneumococcal project, evaluating cellular immunology following alternative uh, PCV vaccination. And today he will tell us some of the new analysis. Welcome, Mr. Ben. Thank you very much for a kind introduction and hello everyone. Um, and I'm so thank you for inviting me to be here to share our data on immunogenicity and memory B cell response. A, um, a part of work of um, the Vietnam pneumococcal project. So the project has been conducted in Ho Chi Minh City, um, a city located in the southern of Vietnam and it's also the biggest city in the country in terms of uh, population. So uh, this is the uh, randomized controlled trial of uh, alternative BCP-10 schedules in infancy with the symbol size in 1400 children. So uh, one of the um, arm uh, project is provide evidence on, the, on which vaccine and schedule is the most appropriate. So we're writing two key questions. The first one is a head-to-head -head comparison of BCV10 and BCV13 in the same schedule of two plus one at two, three, and four months. And the second one, the comparison to different schedules of BCV10, particularly at two, three, four months, and two, four, and nine months schedule or another word, a three plus zero versus a two plus one schedule. So a study will decide to randomize um, divided children into different groups. Group A, um, the original schedule, two plus, or two plus one, with uh, 150 children receiving two doses of BCV-10 at two, three, four months for bribery and booster at nine months. Group B, um, 150 receiving three doses of BCV-10 at two, three, and four months and no booster. Group C, with uh, 250 uh, children who receive three doses of BCV-10 at two and four months for bribery and booster at nine months. Group D or two doses of schedule with 200 children receive only two doses of um, BCV-10 at two and, and six months of eight. And, and group E uh, with 250 children receiving three, dose, three doses of BCV-13 at two, four, for primary and booster at nine months again. And blood sample was taken at two different time points. First, at one month after booster, at nine, nine months, say, or seven months. 
and the next one is 18 months. And level of IgG that uh, specific for search of for boxing types were measured by ELISA and memory B cell were enumerated um, with Alice Brock with a subset of 50 children per group. A diagram here to um, illustrate how to project blood sample and then um, develop a Elisabeth assay for enumerate memory B cell. So kick it up. Um, blood sample was transported to Ho Chi Minh City within four hours after taking. And here, the sample uh, density uh, centrifuge by using the um, PyCon pack or lymphoprep. prep. And after spinning, the BBMC had been collected and verified by washing. Next step is a polyclonal stimulation um, by using the cocktail of three components a shark CBG and pork with mutagen that's a strong inducer to enhance the our memory B cell as spread any antibody is how and for five to six days and in, in this project we uh, just um, lasting for uh, in five days and after that several harvesting prepare for next step so um the harvesting cell Suspension and then add to um, the plate 96 well plate that has a, a natural cellular membrane. Um, before that, the antigen with uh, different cellulose of target cellulose were coded in the plate. And the mixture will incubate at room temperature and to help um, the binding the, the antibody with antigen. After that, we remove all the cell uh, and, and uh, any non-specific binding. After that, the IP con uh, conjugated anti ig were added. Um, and after added um, the citri, the reaction happened and the color has be on the membrane of the plate. Uh, on the right here, that's a typical um, assemble for a support result. Two column A and 90 different cell type of um, assay, IG that positive control, and BBS plus a negative control. So back to the first, uh, the first key question that had to have comparison of BCV10 and BCV13 at the same schedule. And you can see here uh, the picture here in the left at a level antibody of antibody and the right for the B cell and green one for BCV10 and orange for BBC, BCV13. We can see here a BCV13 generate um, into um, the level of antibody higher for all sort of stuff compared to BCV10, should I say for one sort of stuff that's four, that's not much uh, difference. But for B cell, uh, all the sort of sort of similar, not much different, except at um, sort, of top, sort of type one and five, at BCV 10 is a higher. This is the result at um, the first time boy at 10 months of age. And then another time boy at 18 months, the IgG of BCV13 is higher um, as um, four cell types here. At cell type, cell type three, of course, uh, eight, uh, 6C, 18C, and, but 18C and 19F BCV10 is the higher. But for B cell, they are not any significant difference between them. And for the, the next key question is the comparison different schedules of BCV10 
at three dose of schedule, or three blood zero and um, two blood one. For the IgG data, if we expect the booster that better for all sort of better in this IgG for all sort of. Um, but for B cell, they again not much, they more or less, but no different in terms of statical. And as 18 months of age, um, the booster schedule or two plus one schedule remain higher of four cell type, one, four, 18C, and 19F. But again, for B cell, they are similar, just as F, one cell type, 18C, it's a bit higher. Um, of BCV, uh, of um, two blood one schedule compared to three blood, three blood zero. So, so for summary for findings here, when we compare BCV 10 and BCV 13, at 10 months of age, BCV 13 antibody, le antibody levels higher for muscle type and BCV 10 higher for 18C and 19F. But for, for B cell levels, similar for the maturity, five out of seven cell type. But at a, um, 18 months of 18 month, the antibody level similar for most BCV 10 types and BCV 10 remain, remain higher for 18C and 19F. But again, uh, B cell level similar. And what, when comparing BCV10 of three doses of schedule, booster and non booster, at 10 months of age, the antibody levels were higher for all cell types in a two plus one group, uh, and B cell level similar again. At 18 months of age, antibody levels had one and were higher only four out of 13 cell type. However, B cell level was similar in both group. And when we look at the carriage data, so uh, no clearly difference uh, with either three door of schedules. So we have to say that uh, RB cell is a more reliable maker uh, of protection against carrier. So uh, I would like to turn to our colleague at Pattern Steel and uh, those who are from MCRI uh, um, of New Vaccine Group. And basically, I would like to thank um, Dr. Paul Study who helped us organize and um, control to make sure the high quality um, of the test in Vietnam. Uh, I also thank the study participants and their family and other um, funding organization. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tan. Um, yes, we finished. Um, seven speakers. So um, thank you all, all, your, all, um, all the speakers for um, I think kind of keeping to time, um, just that we started the session a bit late. Uh, and yeah, thanks Tan for the top provoking uh, question at the end. Um, so now we're, we're opening up for, for questions. So if anyone has a question, please uh, raise your hand. Um, so uh, in, uh, yeah, sure. I'll repeat the questions for the people online. Yeah. Thank you. 
find more input to set the number of children instead of counting the number of answers. So what Dr. John has or anyone else have an opinion about what do you prefer and why? Thank you. Um, I think I have to repeat the question. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I can. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think the question is sur surrounding um, do, do you base your uh, outcome based on the number of children or do you base it on the number of isolates? Um, and is that, is that the, is right? Okay, Fiona, uh, Fiona will uh, address. Can you hear me? Uh, no? Oh, oh yes. there we go. I'm on. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, in one the um, the um, data that Isoto showed as well, um, it was also the nature of the study design in the Gambia. So that was a, a longitudinal uh, study, I think, with multiple samples taken over time. So each individual child had a few samples taken over, I don't know, 12 months, whatever it was of life. Um, whereas the other ones were either cross-sectional surveys um, taken, and so it was a number of children. Um, for our LAO study, we're doing um, enrolling children with pneumonia and taking one sample. So each child just gets one sample taken, so we're doing that analysis on the children rather than the isolates. Yeah, if that answers your question. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, well... While you're thinking of, I'm sure there are a lot of questions that you you guys have noted down while while you're uh, preparing for that. Uh, there was one question for Isato, uh, which was sort of answered by Amanda Leach, uh, which is uh, where you know the time since vaccination um, for her review, and I mean, uh, Isato has replied that say yes, and this is known from the available data. Um, just to yeah, so and sorry. Can I just mention? Sorry, this is ISA too. Oh, uh, I yes. didn't realize the question was for the review. Um, so for the review, I wasn't able to check um the time since vaccination for for them. I thought this was regarding the study that I would be doing later, which I would have data for. Just to clarify. Yep. Okay. Okay, thank you. Maybe, yeah, maybe I, I was the one who was mistaken that it was for the review. Okay, thank you, Isato. Hi, uh, I'm Anna from the Philippines. Uh, I, I was just um, thinking about the recent um, data that we, that's being um, shared now about uh, the relationship between um, pneumococcal infections and um, um, viral infections, particularly RSV and influenza and uh, the relationship between um, those co-infections and pneumococcal carriage. And in relation to what uh, Isato has been sharing about um, pneumococcal carriage, I was just wondering whether um, how this recent data will impact studies on pneumococcal carriage. Because it seems like there's been a lot of focus on that particular topic, and then we find out now that there are other more important factors, and maybe we've been barking up the wrong tree. Uh, hi, should I? Yes, please, it's a tool <laughs> if you have, uh, and then Fiona will add to it. Okay, you're very right. Like, um, there are st there have been two studies that we've seen um, at the latter part um, that were looking at non pharmaceutical interventions um, in the COVID era, which have, as you've alluded to, shown that indeed um, viral co infection infection is very um, important. And so it does seem as though um, it might be the key factors as opposed to density, but this um, uh, there isn't much data just yet. And it does look like it is, but we, I cannot be certain that that, that that is the answer. But I'm sure there would be studies that we're looking um, at this. And I've written in, in the review um, specifically what you have said. So yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. And I, thanks for that, Isato. And I don't know whether Monica or Catherine wants to add a comment because you've done some stuff on this, which aren't we're not presenting here, but it'd be great to hear. Um, thanks. So I'm Monica Nation, and I'm an epidemiologist um, in uh, the translational microbiology group at MCRI. So 
we've been doing some work looking at the impact of non-pharmaceutical interventions that were implemented to contain COVID and the effect that these have had on pneumococcal carriage and density. So um, globally, we've seen a reduction in IPD during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, it's, we've seen this reduction in um, circulating virus as well. But it's unclear what the um, actual mechanism may be. So how are, how are these viruses um, reducing IPD? So some work that we've been doing is um, looking in some carriage samples in Vietnam. We've seen that while pneumococcal carriage is stable, um, we've seen a reduction in pneumococcal density. So perhaps it's actually um, some kind of relationship between um, virus and density that's causing this reduction in IPD that we've seen. So that works currently, um, well, we're just doing our response to reviewers and should be out in the next couple of months. Cool. Thank you, Monica. Uh, does Catherine want to add to it or that's okay? Okay, cool. Thanks, Monica. Uh, and thanks, Anna, for the question. Um, there's a question for ba uh, Tan. Uh, can you clarify comments about waning IgG? Um, does this align with B cell um, data? Um, so Amanda found that the there's low I, IgG six months post booster, but um, they have no B cell data. Um, what is the best method for correlate of waning? Perhaps um, see how you go and maybe if Paul has anything to add to it. Uh, was that Amanda, was it? Yes, Amanda. Oh, thanks, Amanda. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> it's a good question. I think, um, yeah, I mean, the antibody, uh, we basically found that antibodies and B cells, they do wane, they both wane. Uh, and if you track them over time, they, uh, they kind of wane at a similar rate. But um, what we do find is that um, it's more the, the B cell comparison that we don't really see um, any real differences that we might see with the antibody immediately post vaccination. So that's that's the the critical time point where we're trying to see. We know the B cells are stable, um, even though they do wane, which is kind of a little bit contradictory. But um, we feel that that is a, a probably a better marker potentially for for what's happening with the carriage, because what we found with carriage, or what the translational micro guys found was that there wasn't a lot of difference depending on the groups that we're that we're looking at. So um, I guess that's one explanation. Um, I think Tan agrees as well. <laughs> okay, Tan agrees. Uh, I think Kim Kim has got a, a question. Thank you. Just um, <clears throat> just to expand on what Paul was saying, I think one of the one of the um, striking findings from the study that Tan presented was the finding that the two plus one schedule and the three plus zero schedule produced rather similar uh, B cell responses at 10 months of age. Um, and that really uh, led some people to raise their eyebrows and say, this can't be right, there must be some problem here. Um, but in fact, it correlated very well with the impact on carriage. And it probably is, uh, as you're suggesting, uh, Paul, a, a better marker of the potential impact on carriage than just antibody level which will naturally wane, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the immunity has waned. Thank you. Cool. Thank, thanks, Key. Um, just aware of time, maybe we have we can have one more questions. If anyone has any questions, Darren has a question. Hi, I've got a question. Um, I just like to ask, um, I guess, to uh, Mimi and or uh, John. Uh, so PCV coverage is uh, lower in non lao loom ethnicities in Lao, and I was just um, interested to hear why that might be the case and whether any, say, community outreach um, programs have been implemented in Lao trying to improve uptake in the um, non lao loom ethnicities. Thank you. Um. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Thanks, Darren, for your question. Um, based uh, on my data, that we can see that different ethnic 
city group can result in the PCB coverage. So um, in Lao, in the rural area, especially the non Lao room, they were mold and they, they live in the rural area and um, they, they can't access to the healthcare center, especially the, um, the PCB or immunization in the rural area. And, um, and now, and currently, uh, La government has the, the strategy to, um, to improve the, the immunization in the rural area to, to, um, in order to, to reform the national health um, as well. So, and, and we hopefully, like, um, in the future, the PCB coverage in the rural area will be, um, will be increased in the non la room. Thank you. Okay, cool. If there's no further question, um, please join me in thanking all the speakers today uh, for this session. Um, so I think we'll, uh, uh, we can proceed for lunch, which is at the back of the Ella Latum. And the next session um, for the health economic seminar is it will be it will be in this theater at two o'clock. And then um, there's a microbiology workshop at 1.30. And um, so I get, uh, do you, where, where should they gather for the microbiology workshop? Okay, so um, for all the registrants for the microbiology workshop, please meet um, Casey at the, or at, please meet Lena at the ground floor MCRI reception. And for those who haven't collected your uh, badge, your name tag, please uh, go to the, the front of the Ella Latum. There's a table with all the name tags for you guys. Uh, in that case, um, please enjoy your lunch and uh, proceed to the prospective uh, 